a lot of people get introduced to permaculture through gardening, but hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll get a sense that it's, it's much bigger than that. And if I do my job right, uh, you'll learn why. Um, so best way to predict the future is to design it. I want to talk both about climate uh, permaculture, but in the context of climate change and how this design framework can really be used to uh, deal with a lot of the, some of the most pressing ecological issues uh, today. So let's get started. Just some of you know, um, like Beth said, so my family and I, we live on a three quarter acre lot here in Bozeman. Come on in. Do you want to sit, find a seat somewhere? Oh, and that'd be great. Is it Carl? Thank you. Um, so we live on a three quarter acre lot in Bozeman. And we have a pond, as you can see, that captures water. We have a greenhouse. We have large annual kitchen gardens. Uh, we have a food forest of fruit trees and berry bushes. Our cherry tree just exploded um, last year, and we had a ton of cherries, which we're still eating. Um, we are getting our chickens back. We took a little bit of a hiatus, hiatus over winter, but we're, we have chickens. And we grow, you know, we're working towards growing a good portion of our own food. We're certainly not there yet, um, but we're on our way. Um, once all of our fruit trees start producing in the back, with the chickens, with uh, us hunting, uh, and with all of the annual vegetable gardens, we have a, a lot of it covered, or we can. So what is permaculture? So permaculture was coined in the 1960s by two Australians, Bill Mollison and David Holmgren, and it was in response to the growing use of industrial agriculture methods, which they saw were leading to water and air pollution, to soil degrada degradation, and to a lot of the ecological crises that, were, that are even more heightened today, right? So, they came up with this whole concept, and it stands for permanent agriculture or permanent culture, right? And it's not a technique. It's not a strategy, right? It's a design method. It's a design framework. So you can look at it as the harmonious integration of landscape and people that provides food, energy, shelter, and other needs in a sustainable way. You can also think of permaculture as a toolbox, right? So there are all sorts of tools in your toolbox, and you take different tools out depending on what you need, right, at the time. So in, depending on your climate, depending on the culture, depending on the region, depending on what you want to do, right? Not all of the tools in your toolbox you're going to use at the same time. And in fact, some of those tools are not so useful, you know, in certain contexts and climates. So what it gives you is this, you're taking engineering, you're taking knowledge from ecology, from biology, from appropriate technology, right? And you're using it to grow your own food and medicine, right? To capture energy um, and to live more sustainably, right? So it integrates the knowledge and, knowledge and practice and it draws from many disciplines linking them into solutions, right, that meet the human needs, but while ensuring a resilient future, right? Because right now, we're meeting our needs, well, at least in the Western world, pretty well, more than well, right? But we're not ensuring a very resilient future. And the reason, and one of the reasons I love permaculture is it's all based in positive solutions, right? So I could stand up here and talk to you about every single thing that's wrong, ecologically that's going on right now in terms of the climate crisis, right? There's, you know, all of us, right, could come up with those problems, right? But I prefer not to stay in that. And I prefer not to be against what is happening, but instead create examples of what, how you could live differently. Oh, I love that. Thank you very much. <laughs> I love to encourage all of us. <laughs> shift our perspective away from what we don't like and toward what we do like and support that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Sahara, for that resounding yes. Because a lot of it is about not, you know, people, not shaming people, 
right, in terms of what they're not doing, but instead bring, you know, being inclusive and providing an opportunity to be part of something. And that's, people want to belong to something that's positive, that makes them feel good. And it's a worldwide movement, right? It doesn't have any government support or large institutional support. This is a grassroots level thing where people in different communities across the world are implementing permaculture projects, are using permaculture principles to design better lives. So we have, you know, permaculture design courses that happen everywhere, India, Jordan, Kenya, Australia, and then we did one in Montana a couple years ago. And these usually look like two week long courses where you get an intensive 72 hour curriculum around everything there is to know about permaculture. So it's just a touch on various topics and every topic you could go a lot deeper, right? But at least you get an idea of what the possibilities are. And it's all about creating possibilities. So permaculture design aims are a closed system that meets its own needs, right? As much as possible, let's create closed looped systems um, on our properties and in our communities. High yields of food, fertilizer, fun, community, all of that. Low maintenance, that one takes a while, <laughs> you know, to get there, right? Non-polluting, and you're harmonizing with natural patterns rather than working against them. And it's a diverse and resilient system that can endure adverse conditions, right? And these adverse conditions are what we're looking at when we're talking about climate change, right? How do we create a stable, diverse, and resilient system when we know that the climate is changing, that the temperature is going up, that we might have wetter springs um, and hotter summers? Come on in. So let's talk about permaculture and climate change, right, together. So climate change is a crisis of systems, right? A crisis of ecological systems, of political systems, of social systems. You could argue it's a crisis of moral systems, right? And there's no single blanket solution, right? And when you're dealing with permaculture and how you design a place, right, you're, you know, there are lots of people out there that want like a one quick fix for agriculture. How do we, how do we feed seven billion people? Well, we don't just feed them with one techno fix, right? That's not going to work. And that's not uh, how permaculture works, right? You need to fit the local conditions, the terrain and the culture, right? What's happened is that we have gone so far out of scale, right? That we're using one solution for everything in terms of industrial agriculture, we're gonna use a giant combine, we're gonna farm this acreage and we're gonna get a yield from it, right? But every region is different. Every climate is different. The soil is different. All of those different considerations need to, to come into play. So when you're thinking about solutions to climate change, right, you have to think systems wide, right? There's not one quick fix. So you need to look at patterns, you look, need to look at relationships and flows. So permaculture is all about systems thinking. So it's an integrated approach. So rather than thinking of your yard, right, where you have, we have a tendency to have the vegetable garden over here, the flower garden over here, the place where the kids play over here. You know, everything's segregated we've kind of become this reductionist society where everything's segregated. Well, your whole yard is an ecosystem, right? It is integrated, right? And to view it as an integrated ecosystem is how you wanna do it, that those things can be integrated, right? The flower garden can be integrated with the vegetable garden. The chickens can oftentimes be integrated with your garden. You know, so there's a way to bring it all together. So permaculture is guided by three ethics, right? Care of the earth. So care of the earth, that every living thing on this planet has an intrinsic worth, right? Rivers, streams, forests, care of people. But the reason that we want to use this design frame framework, the reason that we are trying to integrate landscape and people to meet our food, shelter, and energy needs, right, is to take care of us, right? And then the third ethic is fair share. And what that means is that if we have a surplus 
of something um, that we feed it back to the first two ethics, right? So if you have a surplus in your system of manure, you feed it back to the soil. If you have a surplus of vegetables, you give them to your friends, right? If you have a surplus of time, you help your neighbors in their garden, right? So it's that, that idea that if you do have a surplus, you're feeding it back into the system again, not a linear system, right? This circular system. And inherent in that fair share also is that there are some limits to our consumption, right? That we can't just go on taking and taking without giving back. So, but the current reality, right? Most of us, wouldn't you say, a lot of us live by those three ethics. No, we help our friends out when they need it. We take care of the planet. We go on, especially in Bozeman, right? We're going on hikes. We appreciate the outdoors. We take care of our friends and our family, right? So those ethics aren't necessarily something that are particular to permaculture, right? But that's, that is how they're defined. But our current reality is very different, right? We have a linear system, right? Rather than a circular system, a closed loop system, we extract here, we use it, we dump it in a landfill, right? It's a very extractive economy. Unlimited growth. We think that we can have unlimited growth, right? Because that's how we grow our economy, that's how people prosper, right? But if people are connected to natural systems, they know that natural systems don't have unlimited growth, right? There's a threshold. And it's our disconnection from natural systems where we think that that's, that can work and that can function, and we won't get a feedback that that somehow is going to, that that's going to break down. One of the ethics that we have right now in this society is that accumulation of wealth over all other values, right? That, in a sense, is driving a lot of the issues, a lot of the ecological and environmental issues that we're dealing with. And again, because of our disconnection from natural systems. So one of the reasons I like to teach people and reconnect people to gardens is because that's, that's the easiest entryway, right? To getting somebody to put a seed in the soil and watch that plant grow and get a yield from that plant, right? That's the, the first way or the easiest way to have people have a connection to a natural cycle again, right? Because many of us, less of us in Bozeman, right, because this region, this culture, is very much a culture connected to the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. It's very much a culture that understands conservation and wilderness, right? But we are not the majority, right? The vast majority of people live in very large, dense cities where there is very little connection to the natural world. So people who don't understand the importance of it can make decisions about it without, you know, there's, there's no connection to it or no understanding of it. So you need, instead, we want to have a, an ethic that's based on caring, sharing, mutual responsibility, and understanding that we're inter interdependent, right? Again, if you study natural systems, in a forest, everything is connected. Right? The tree is not separate from the soil, is not separate from the birds that come into that system, right? So again, if we can reconnect people to natural systems and they understand that everything is integrated, right, then that's a step towards getting people to understand that it's all, everything that's happening right now is a giant feedback loop, right, on this planet. So Bill Mollison, one of the co-originators of permaculture, when the needs of a system are not met from within, we pay the price in energy and pollution, right? So all of these things, right? Massive factory farm, huge issues with methane, with manure becomes a problem, right? Huge industrial agriculture, not only are you burning fossil fuels, right? You're degrading the soil. And I think, I don't know if that's a nuclear power plant, but it's, you know, polluting, polluting the environment. Enough about the negative stuff. So this is an industrial agriculture farm, factory lot, right? <laughs> this is a permaculture farm. 
we understand we don't want a linear system, right, where you have these cows, you extract the meat out of them, you're left with their poop, which is a huge liability. Let's try for a closed loop system, right, where you have the, and then the cows, you're feeding the cows grain that you have to import, right? Let's try a permaculture system where the cows are eating the grass, they're in pasture, they're pooping on the pasture that's feeding the soil that grows back up. There are trees in this area that are providing shade for them. The trees are capturing solar energy. They're providing shade. Possibly they're producing food at the same time, right? That's a circular system where suddenly the poop is not a liability, it's a resource, right? Because it's been, it's found its need in the system. You've connected it to the need. So here, I can't tell you how many gardeners, I, questions I get all the time, where can I get some manure? My gardeners in this valley are always looking for compost, for, for manure, for fertility, right? So how can we connect the dots even within this valley, right? Of every year, I get my manure from this woman, Wendy, who you know, has a bunch that she doesn't need, right? That's a connection that I can make. It's free, it's providing fertility for my land. And in that sense as well, right, so it, not only do you want to think about closed loop systems in your yard, right, and on your property, creating as many of them as possible, right, not importing stuff. Don't export your leaves off the property, right, those are a huge resource that you can use to mulch your garden, to build compost piles, it's a high carbon material that's really good, right. You don't want to import that much onto your property, right. In the first few years when you establish something, you're going to have to do that, right? But you're also thinking of closed loop systems within your yard, but closed loop systems within your community too, right? So a waste, the coffee grounds from tree line or ghost town or something like that become a resource for you, right? So one of the things that we do in permaculture is we want to shift from fire to flow. We want to shift from burning oil, gas, and coal, right? And we want to capture flows of energy the, from the sun, the wind, the water in renewable ways. So that could be passive solar homes, that could mean greenhouses, solar panels, solar hot water, building rainwater catchment systems, rain gardens, swales, which are ditches that are on contour, wind turbines, geothermal heat. So again, we're going from fire to flows of free energy that come onto the property. How can we maximize those and use those in our system to grow food, to give us shelter, to give us energy, what have you. So these are all kind of alternative energies that are out there, right? Some of them you want to keep in mind that there are alternative energies and then there are appropriate ones for the site, right? But that's, that's all stuff that's available right now, right? Another thing that we do within kind of the permaculture framework, right, is encouraging local agriculture. So first off, local agriculture reduces our ecological footprint from farm to table. So who knows the average, I'm sure a lot of you know, the average miles that food travels from farm to table in the US? Anyone? 1,500 miles, yeah. So the more we can localize our food, we're already cutting down significantly on our fossil fuel use, right? And so we're doing that, and not only that, but it's supporting healthy soil, it's supporting organic and sustainable practices. So we have here great examples, CSAs, community gardens, residential gardens, right? all sorts of different things. It also means, local agriculture also means food security. So maybe Erin, you know too, if all the trucks stopped today, how many days would we have before we ran out of food? Anyone? Three days. So food security, right? The more we can keep it local, the better, you know? If the truck stopped today, we got two chest freezers full of meat and fruit, and you know, we'll be okay at least for a week, 
probably, you know, a month, right, if we had to, or more, right? So that's, that's the difference, right? And it doesn't mean that you yourself have to have that, right? But we have networks of people that have that food available, and we're not relying on it from a long ways away. And ultimately, right, local agriculture contributes to building that resilient local economy, right? It all feeds one another. When you support the local farmer, right, you support his or her family, they invest in the community, you know them as people, not just as a company, all of that gives you a better sense of community. And of course, there are all of the intangible benefits, right, that go with this. There are the hard numbers, the quantitative numbers, that you can rattle off, right? But there's all the intangible benefits. If you go from that lot to this lot, right? If you go from this, this is in Massachusetts, Eric, Eric, Eric Tonsmeyer that wrote the book Paradise Lot. That's what they did there. Brad Lancaster and Tucson, when you're capturing your water rather than piping it away from your system, you go from that to that, right? Ron Finley, who is known as the gangsta gardener in South Central LA, right? These are the tree lawns, right? Between the sidewalk and the road. And he started gardening these in a place where there are food deserts in South and Central LA, right? This is the kind of change that, that can happen. And our local farmers markets, right? So all of that, those are a lot of intangible benefits. There is the benefit of the food, right? But there's the benefit of the community. There's the benefit of the conversation that's happening between those two people, right? Of actually caring and knowing the people that you live around and with. So another thing in permaculture or that, I mean, it's not just permaculture that, that is promoting this, right? Um, it's many different fields, but it's something called carbon farming. And so a third of the excess carbon dioxide comes from agricultural practices, right? From overgrazing, from tilling, from clearing, right? So what if instead of agriculture being um, part of the problem, right, we can actually use carbon farming to make it part of the solution? And what that looks like is if you start to build soil, right, you start to, so when you're tilling, Right? What happens? You release the carbon, it oxidizes, it creates CO2. Right? So if you use no-till methods, if you start building the organic matter in the soil, um, and if you use cover crops in instead of bare soil, right, you're releasing less and less CO2 into the atmosphere. And not only that, you're reconnecting to natural systems. Right? Nature abhors a vacuum. Nature does not like bare soil. Right? It wants to keep it covered. So you're creating and continuously building soil and keeping the organic matter in the soil rather than degrading it. Um, and one thing that happens, of course, in this situation is when you have overgrazing, when you have tilling, not only are you releasing carbon dioxide, right, but you're destroying the soil food web, you're destroying the beneficial microorganisms in the soil. Um, so all of this stuff can help to reduce emissions, right? But at the same time, it's also elevating natural processes. What's silvopasture? Silvopasture is when you, rather than just pasturing animals while in a big, large field, right? You also have trees. So it's livestock and trees. And I'll explain it a little bit more in a couple of the slides. So just a heads up for those, have any of you heard of this book? So it's The Carbon Farming Solution by Eric Tonsmeyer. And it's all about perennial crops, regenerative agriculture, and climate change solutions. So it's definitely something to check out. Again, this whole idea that agriculture can be a solution to climate change rather than a problem or a contributor of climate change. So silvopasture is when you pasture animals rather than in a large field, you pasture and there are trees in between the animals. So the trees can actually give you a yield. They can be fruits or nuts or something like that, or they can give shade. And what that does is the animals are happier, right? Because they're more shaded, they, they're in a nicer place. 
they're pooping on the ground, they're fertilizing the trees, the trees give you a yield. So again, it's one of those circular systems. And this is an example of Versaland in Iowa City. It's a 145 acre farm. So it is a silvopasture and it has trees and livestock, perennial field crops, um, superfoods, and then there's a nursery, there's a mushroom operation, and there are pigs. So again, multiple uses for this one tract of land, right? You're not just using that tract of land to pasture animals, right, or to pasture cows, right? You're using it to build a resilient, diverse system that will withstand adverse conditions, right? Not only as a natural system, but as a business, right? So that if one of your yields doesn't work one year, you can fall back on something else. Another thing to do in permaculture is to plant food forests, right? So not only are you planting, whoops, oh no, I lost my little stuff in there. Well, anyway, what it said was you're planting trees, you're planting water, right? Because you're mulching around those trees and that's keeping in the soil moisture, right? You're building soil, you're building community, you're growing food, right? Multiple, multiple use, multiple yields out of this one system, right? And of course the trees are sequestering car carbon. So this is our lot in 2012 when we moved here, the back area of our yacht, lot, the, what we call the back 40 on our three quarter <laughs> acre lot. And this is it in 2016. So this is a food forest, it's a little hard to see, right? I have cherry tree, apple tree, another apple tree, there's a plum tree in the foreground, there's clover that's building fertility, there are iris, there are roses that you can eat, the rose hips, um, there are chives over there, there is lupin that's building fertility, there's um, valerian root as well that's useful to help with sleep. So again, you can see that this whole area, right, is way more productive for one, and it's capturing way more solar energy, and it's giving food, and people come here and see, you know, what's going on, and I guess, like it <laughs> and, and want to have a garden like it. So again, it's inspiration, it's education, and it's all of those other intangible benefits, right? While at the same time, providing, you know, that cherry tree last year, like I said, tons, hundreds of cherries off of that tree. And it's beautiful. And it's beautiful, right. That's that intangible benefit. So Miracle Farms in Quebec, Canada, so zone five. Um, so close to our, our um, hardiness zone, but he's converted five of those acres. It used to be just a regular orchard, but he's converted five of those acres into a permaculture you pick orchard where he's put in a diversity of different things. So rather than just, you know, rows of the same apple trees, right, you have this massive diversity. Again, so if the apples don't produce one year, right, there's all these other yields that you can get, all these other things that people can pick. So we were in California this winter for part of the time and we were driving up through the Central Valley. Who has driven through the Central Valley? Yeah, yeah. Everyone should drive through the Central Valley to understand the, the level of monoculture, right? that's going on miles and miles of almond groves, miles and miles of citrus, all the same, no diversity in sight, right? Just rows and rows of the same thing. That's not resilient. That's not diverse. What if a disease hits those miles and miles of almonds, right? And they're having to, you know, all the, a lot of the bees from here in Montana get trucked down there, right? So they're having to import pollinators in order to support that system, right? If you had a diversity of different things, right, in that system like this, right, and below that you had an herb herbaceous layer that attracted beneficial insects into that system, right, you're suddenly creating a system that supports itself, 
rather than you having to prop it up. So this is another example of New Forest Farm in Viola, 106 acre broad, broad acre perennial agricultural farm, right? And what people are doing within the permaculture movement, right, is really encouraging perennial systems, right? Because annual systems, you're tilling all the time. So you're releasing all that carbon dioxide into the, and not to mention it's more work, right? So how can we create more perennial systems where you're planting trees that provide food and so long term, right, that's a much better system where you're not having to till, where you're not having to put as much labor in every year. And again, they have, not only do they have the fruit tra trees and nut trees and berry bushes, but then they have the animals that are part of that system that are fertilizing that system, right? Because oftentimes, if you have an almond grove, right, that's just one system, you're importing fertilizer into that system, whereas here, you let the animals do the work for you. Oh my gosh, I think this is an old, <laughs> I don't know what's going on. This is an, I'm sorry, I apologize. I think this is an old thing. Anyway, that's unfortunate. Anyway, the next thing is decreasing food waste. So food waste, is a huge issue, right? 30% of the food that we produce here, or produce globally, actually gets wasted. So if you think about the initial input of energy, time, fertilizer, everything that went to produce that food, then to package it, then to have it in the grocery store, and then to sell it, right? and then for it to go into the garbage can. It's insane, right? So what we want to do is we want to decrease food waste. And the first thing we want to do is we want to decrease it at the supply end, right? So some initiatives, of course, are where, so Farmented, who knows the, the company Farmented in town? So they just started out, they're, they're, a, they're a new company, and what they're doing is they're, they're taking the ugly vegetables, Right, the ones that, you know, because when you go to a farmer's market or a grocery store, if the vegetable looks kind of weird or whatever, you don't want to, you're like, I don't want that, or a lot of people say that, right? So they're taking all those ugly vegetables and they're converting them into fermented foods. So they're creating a value-added product, right? They're using food that would otherwise go to waste, right? And they're creating a living, well, I'm not sure quite yet, but they're, you know, they're on their way to creating a business, right, that gives them, you know, a living, and it's local, right? So for all of those reasons, you know, it's something that you, I'm a big fan, it's something that you want to support, and not, not to mention they're creating something of food, they're giving it even more value and nutrition by fermenting it. What's the name of the company? Farmented. And they've, what they've done is they've partnered with Strike Farms, which is a local farm here in town, right? And they're using all of that produce. So again, it's that cooperation, collaboration piece. Then the other thing that I had on here that's not showing up is obviously home scale. So if you can't, if you can't prevent the food from being wasted, right? At least on some level, you can take that food waste and you can compost it. Because what happens when it goes into a landfill is the decomposition creates releases methane, contributes to greenhouse gases, contributes to climate change, right? So if you can instead, rather than that material putrefying and decomposing anaerobically, if you can have an aerobic process where you're creating compost on your property, right, that goes back into your garden, back into your system and creates a closed loop system, that's what you want, right? And if you don't have a garden, right, again, there's the yard level of design, there's the community level of design, Right? So if you don't have, not everyone's wanting to garden, not everyone wants to compost, there are things, who's heard of Happy Trash Can? Yeah, great company in town that picks up your compost, gives you a five gallon bucket, you put all your food waste in it, right? They pick it up every week, they take it to the farm, they create compost over there, they drop you off with an empty bucket, right? So again, design systems thinking, on your yard, 
in your community. So definitely, again, companies to support and initiatives that go a long way in terms of creating and reducing our carbon emissions locally. So another thing in permaculture is all about energy efficient planning, right? So it's called zoning. Uh, and you place elements in your system according to how much you use them and how often. So in a yard, right, you would put your herbs, your lettuce, things that you want to care for and use on a daily basis closer to your house, right? Because you need to, your tomatoes, oftentimes you need to care for them more often. So make it convenient for yourself to put them closer in. Whereas your onions, potatoes, squash, carrots, things that are in irrigation that have to grow the entire season, right? You, put them, you can put them farther away. Or again, your fruit trees, your berry bushes, all of that can go farther away from you. It doesn't have to if you don't have a lot of space, but just think about planning in terms of where you put things. And if you're thinking about, again, having animals, right, in zone three, you have your pasture, your fruit and nut trees, your cash crops. In zone four, that's where you have your, possibly you're growing for timber, right? Because again, you're trying to meet all of your energy needs in this situation. And then zone five is the unmanaged wilderness zone, right? So zone zero is your house here, and then you're going out. Now, it doesn't necessarily look like concentric circles around your house, right? But Things like the Caragana hedge, right, that's on the west side of our house is zone five, right? We don't maintain that. We don't harvest anything from that. But that's great bird habitat, right? And so if you're in town, you often maybe just have zones one and two and maybe five because you have a lilac shrub somewhere, right? But it depends on the scale of your property. So. In this design that I did for a client, right, your, your house, the house is here. So your annual kitchen gardens are really close. This is where the kitchen is. There's a back door right here. You go out here. You have your annual garden space and your herbs and all of that. There's a little lawn because they have kids. You want your chicken coop to be fairly close to your house in a cold climate because you're going out there every day um, and you just don't want to go that far in the wintertime. Well, I don't. Um, and then this whole area is food forest area, right, where you're, you don't have to uh, maintain it as often. So in my yard, this was a few years ago, right, our deck is right here, right? There are herbs here, there's a greenhouse here. These are all annual gardens, this is mostly tomatoes, right? because I need these to be close because I'm covering the tomatoes, I'm making sure that nothing's eating them, I'm you know, making sure that the frost cloth is over them. So again, all of this is really close. The food forest that I showed you is way back here. Right? So this, for between here and here, is like 200 feet or something like that. Right? So I'm not going there every day. No. So make it, make it efficient in terms of the design of your yard. And then what you do, again, yard community. Right? It's all about design and de designing your lifestyle, right? People are starting to make those intentional choices of being in a city where it's walkable. Bozeman is a completely walkable city, bikeable city, right? So what you do is your house is here, your work is within walking distance, your child's school is within walking distance, things that you visit on a regular basis are within walking distance, things that you visit on a weekly basis or within biking distance, right? Things that you visit may maybe every two weeks or public transit. And then you go to the car and to the plane, right? You know, you only take a plane maybe once a year, or maybe you don't once every couple of years or something like that. But what you're trying to do is you're trying to design your life with the idea of a low energy future, right? And besides which, again, there are the intangible benefits of being able to walk everywhere, right? And so how can we design cities that are more in this realm, right? 
how can we design something like this where maybe there's a community garden that's right next to an apartment, right? Where people use this for their food source and maybe there's a grocery store down the road or maybe you're working from home so maybe your, your livelihood is at home so you don't even have to walk, right? You just roll out of bed, right? And then your food is 20 feet from your door, right? So again, trying to look at these low energy futures, it's all about design, okay? It is also about privilege. You know, we're not talking here, I'm not gonna go into all the social and economic systems that we have to deal with as well, right? But that's why what Ron Finley in LA is doing is so powerful, right? Is here's a food desert. There is no fresh food around here. We live in LA, right? We could grow a lot of food. Let's create it and design it that way. Wow, I think something, anyway. So the next one is self-regulated and accept feedback. So this is an actual permaculture principle. And the whole idea here is this understanding that change is constant, right? So I think, again, we're not connected to natural systems. So we think that everything should remain the same all the time, right? But change is a constant and we need to accept the feedback and do something differently. Because right now the feedback from this planet is I'm heating up, things aren't so great, let's do something about it, right? And I think though I understand and am sympathetic to communities where say cool, right? Or mining has been their way of life, right? We need to, our resistance to change is part of the issue, right? That's where the social systems is the crisis, right? Because there are all sorts of fantastic economies that could be built off of sustainable energy, right? Local agriculture, you know, value added products and local food, all sorts of work that could happen, right? But it's a question of how do we change the resistance to change, right? We all have it with everything in our lives in general, right? On a personal basis of like, well, I don't wanna do that. That's not what I'm used to doing, right? But that's exactly what it is. And that if we're connected back to natural systems, everything changes. In your yard, if you grow tomatoes in this spot one year and they don't work, you should probably change where you grow tomatoes, right? That's a natural order of things. You accept the feedback and you grow them over here, right? Or if you're growing something and it's not thriving, you accept the feedback and say, I might have to build my soil better next year, right? All of those things are part of our participation in this whole web of life. Oh, and there it is. I'm so sorry. So, other thing is to create community and to restore community. Right? We've lost that a lot with the industrial agriculture system. We've lost this, um, you know, you don't, now you, you don't talk to your neighbors because you like them. You know, it used to be that, you know, if you liked your neighbors, you went over, you hung out, you shared things, you shared resources. Now it's like, well, I don't want to bother them, you know. And we've designed our houses such that you just drive into the garage, the garage closes, and then you go into your house, right? So you haven't created an opportunity to interact there. Or you've designed your neighborhoods where that's the case. You know, one of the things where I live, we're just on Bridger Drive, you know, there's no sidewalk, right? So it's these three quarter acre lots, right? So I get to, I really know my neighbor next door really, really well, right? But there are not a lot of opportunities, right, to run into my other neighbors necessarily. I can run into the ones in the back, but not along the side, because I'm not, there's no sidewalk to walk along. So again, designing better systems, better neighborhoods, right, to create community, neighborhoods around growing food, right? All of those are what we want to build because we've lost a lot of that. Instead, what we have are com online communities, right? 
which are fine, but they're not the same. Like a community is where you live geographically, right? Online communities are groups, they, they, they provide a certain level of support, but really what we want is we want to get to know and be more connected to the places that we're in. Okay, here we go. <laughs> so in Montana, okay, so let's get, get back to, speaking of local, let's get back to, in Montana, by the end of the century, this is according to the Montana Climate Assessment, Montana temperatures are projected to increase 5.6 to 9.8 degrees. Um, and these state level changes are larger than the average projected globally. Across the state, precipitation is projected to increase in the winter, spring, and fall. Precipitation is projected to decrease in the summer. So what we're looking at is wetter winters and springs, possibly falls, hotter, summers. How do we design for resilience in that situation, right? So again, we're looking at, if that's the case, right, do we need to capture water, right, in the spring, in cisterns and ponds and in the ground? Problem is the ground is frozen. But also, isn't it against the law around here? In certain cases, Yes, in certain cases it is. Not like in Colorado or not like it was in Colorado, right? It depends. It's famous permaculture response, it depends. It depends on the water rights that you might potentially have on your property um, and, and whether or not you're able to do that. So it, it depends on where you are, whether you're in, within the city or the county. And also the view here is if you're capturing it in the ground, it's going in the ground anyway, right? So, so we can talk more about that if you want. Maurice, did you want to say something? Yeah. Oh, you look like you were going to say something. No? Oh, maybe later. Okay, uh, just <laughs> not to put you on the spot. So earthworks to prevent erosion and runoff. So again, we don't want to pipe it and pave it and pollute it, right? We want to slow it, stink it, sink it and store it, not stink it. So we don't want that raw water to be run off, running off, right, through impermeable surfaces. We want to get it back into the ground. This is a thing that I'm going to start to experiment with, right, planting warmer zone plants possibly, right, colder zone plants maybe, or plants that span a larger zone. You know, so, so when you have, say, an apple tree, right, and they say, you know, this is good from zone, USDA hardiness zone two to seven, right? Then you're probably pretty good in there that that's gonna work, right? If you have one particular plant that's like only good for zone four, you know, that, you can put that in your system, but know that that might be an issue in the coming years, right? Plant a diversity of crops, again, I was talking about this the other day, not only a diversity of different things, right? Apples, pears, cherries, whatever, peppers, tomatoes, carrots, but within those, within the tomatoes, you plant seven different varieties, right? If you have four apple trees, they're all different, right? Or three different types of plum trees, right? So you're not, again, choosing just one particular variety. There might be possible food sources, right? Zone five, exciting, possibly peaches. You know, that's one good thing, possibly. And then this whole idea of planting shade. So if we're gonna be hotter and drier, right, and you want your system to be more resilient, you wanna lose less water, right, plant shade. That shade could also provide food at the same time, but if you think of your yard, right, or if your property, you want to have that more shady areas. So a couple just last things. Who's heard of this book, Drawdown? Yeah. So this is really, I really like this because it's a kind of, if you go to Drawdown slash solutions, it gives you a list of, they've done all of this work. Again, they've brought together all sorts of different scientists, conservationists, engineers, biologists, to come up 
with these solutions. How many, does anybody remember how many solutions? There's 100, isn't it? Something like that, of how to reduce carbon emissions. And a lot of them are related to stuff that we talked about, you know, solar farms, um, silvopasture, pasture, decreasing food waste, planting forests. And they, they define it as there are no regrets solutions, right? There's intrinsic benefits to the communities and rural economies. Regardless, okay, regardless of whether you believe that the climate is changing or not, regardless if you, if you want to argue why and then by how much and by whom, if you do these things, they're just good. <laughs> They're just great things that make people feel good, that build community, that give people meaning, right? And there's nothing that, in fact, is probably more important in a lot of ways, right? That's that moral system, that social system uh, that we become so disconnected to. So do them anyway. So lastly, just this whole idea that we're all designers, right? We all looked in the closet this morning and figured out what we wanted to wear, right? We all, <laughs> we all arranged our couch and our you know, chairs in a certain way in our house, right? All of us are, to an extent, designers. We make choices every day that have to do with design, right? So how do we design a system where more and more people adopt and live by permaculture ethics? And, they do, and we don't need to call it permaculture, right? I don't care, I have, no con I have no attachment to that term, right? It's all about community building, it's all about growing more food, it's all about connecting to natural systems, right? How do we design systems where more people care, right? So how do we design cities that are more walkable, that have food forests, that have agri-hoods, right, instead of just neighborhoods? that use appropriate technologies, right? How do we design those cities based on the culture, the climate, and the political system that we're in, right? I'm not gonna advocate really hard in Montana for a plant-based diet, right? Instead, I'm gonna advocate for silvopasture, right? Those are, the, those are what we wanna do, right? I'm not gonna say everyone should be a vegetarian, not here, right? Strong hunting culture, right? I'm not going to make a lot of friends that way. But there are definitely a lot of people that think that local food is important, that are, would be open to silvopasture, right? That want to keep on ranching as a way of life. So think about how you design those systems, again, based on the region that you're in. And then permaculture systems mean abundance, you know, in food and relationships and resources and in experience. So just to let you know, I have a couple things coming up. I have a sign-up sheet there. For those of you who aren't on it, I send out a newsletter. You can get on it with your phone if you have a phone, but I send out a newsletter usually once a week with garden tips and advice or videos or um, upcoming events. So that's the sign-up sheet there. There are all sorts of um, upcoming workshops that are happening. I do an edible backyard series, which is all about planning and designing your backyard using permaculture principles. I go over composting and soil building and gardening strategies and techniques. So that's coming up starting on Wednesday and there's more information or you can come talk to me about it. Also, I wanna let you know that I'm hosting a documentary film, it's free, on Thursday, April 12th, back here at the library, because I love spending time at the library, um, called Living the Change, Inspiring Stories for a Sustainable Future. And um, it's just, again, all of these examples, these positive examples of what people in different communities are doing um, around sustainability. So definitely come and check that out if you want. Uh, and there's more information there. There's a takeaway flyer right here with all of the upcoming stuff that's going on. And then Permaculture Homestead Series. So I do do this live um, series two consecutive Saturdays where we really drill down into actually the permaculture principles, um, building your soil, capturing water, and then food forests and small animals. So talking about building food forests and using small animals like chickens and ducks um, in those systems. And that takes place here. 
and there's more information about that as well. And then finally, I am part of this online, women's online permaculture design course. So uh, there's 40 of us. I'm one of the women that's teaching one of the modules. So like I said, these are usually in-person, two-week-long permaculture design courses. And a lot of stuff is going online now. Um, and you know there are advantages and disadvantages to that. But we're all in some way, shape, or form, all permaculture practitioners. And the whole idea behind this was to elevate women's voices in permaculture, because oftentimes the people that you see most, most visible in the permaculture movement are men. And so this was an um, idea that came about um, by Heather Jo Flores, who wrote the book Food Not Lawns. Um, who came up with this. So I'm teaching one of the modules. We already have uh, a bunch of local people here that are signed up for it. And I'm trying to make, though it's online, right? Again, I want to make this a locally based um, community learning experience. So we're going to have local gatherings and potlucks and stuff related um, to the, the design course. So you learn, you know, self-paced, on your own, but then we come together and we digest this stuff. And just because it's called a women's online permaculture course, it's also for men. It's just taught all by women. So you are most welcome. So here are all of the upcoming things.